So if everything is uh, not right, or if I say something stupid, then of course it's because I'm a microbiologist. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about pragmatic functional programming. Uh, I will talk about programming, obviously, and then the most of the part about functional programming, and then in the end, hopefully, it will also become pragmatic. So my name is Jervo Veliu. I'm a senior software engineer at Flock Community. There are people over there with the shirts uh, supporting. <laughs> And uh, what I do for a living, I implement business rules for clients, like we all do, right? So I want to focus on those business rules. Usually we're doing that in a, uh, in a framework, and usually that's an object-oriented programming framework, like Spring, for instance. And with these objects, of course, we can have internal state in these objects, and that can be hard to test. And to test our implementations, just like we heard with hexagonal architecture, uh, you need inversion of control somehow to uh, manage your test implementations. So how is this uh, going to work? Uh, so normally in Spring, where you have dependency injection, the main method uh, in Spring opens up the Spring context where you register beans. For instance, a controller that needs to be injected with a service and that needs to be injected with a repository. But of course, this is all state. It's all objects that have state. And that can, in turn, be uh, hard to test. So what do we need to do? And what are some of the questions that I have here? The true polymorphic dependency that you actually want to reason about is, of course, the repository. Because that is, uh, as we've seen, it can be a port uh, to different databases then the service actually should be pure, right? Should be the business logic, should not have internal state. But then the controller actually needs to inject the service and then only inject the repository. So what is the real dependency here? It's not, not the service, it's not the controller, but it's the repository. And then when you have a, a test setup, you need to maybe mock all that. So you, either you need to mock the service or the repository, and that's, that can be quite a hassle. And at least maybe to a deep dependency tree. And you have singletons as uh, code holders. And that might be a anti-pattern. So, of course, this can be really helpful. And I, I, I like working in Spring because it takes all the hard work away from me. And I can actually focus on my business rules. But can we maybe do this in a better way? And before we go to the obvious answer, functional programming, I have some questions about uh, OOP because are methods not just functions? And is a constructor not just a function, but only partially applied? And is dependency injection not just passing parameters in functions all the way down? And objects can just data containers, right? It's just data. So why do we need to go to functional program? Because there is function there, right? We even have a keyword in Kotlin that says fun. It's function. But actually, a function has a really specific meaning in mathematics. And all these things aren't actually not functions. <laughs> so then what is functional programming? What are functions? Uh, functions actually are uh, mathematically a mapping between a domain and a code domain. OK, I don't know what that means. But pragmatically, functional program is a declarative programming style. So you describe your intent with functions and not with methods or maybe better known as procedures. But then there are some uh, rules you might want to adhere to in order to have actual functions, so pure functions or mathematically just functions. It means that the same input yields the same result. So if you have a sum function that adds two and three, you always get back five. There is no internal counter counting how many times you did this. No, the result depends only on the input. And then the, these are these other things that we might have heard. Uh, you should not have side effects. You should be stateless. And because this is a declarative programming style, you also need to have some lazy evaluation. You cannot execute your code immediately. And all this means, actually, that your function should be referentially transparent, meaning that if you have the sum of 2 and 3, you can also replace it with 5. And of course, if you have referential transparency, you have all the uh, things above. And you can actually do this in tests. So testing becomes really easy because you can just swap 
uh, these implementations. Okay, uh, no side effects, no state. Uh, awesome, I only have my sum function. Uh, let's not call it an app then, right? Because what does your app do? It needs to interact with customers. It needs to uh, store state in a database. It should do logging. So what, how are we going to manage these things? How are we going to manage these, uh, these, uh, these effects? Well, the programmers of Haskell actually uh, solve this problem and uh, they came up with effectful functions. So these are functions, but they describe some effect. For instance, an input output on a string. And then you can compose these functions, like normal functions, with, for instance, map and flat map. You can compose these functions all the way to one main effect, which could be the main uh, function and actually your program. And that would be a function where the result actually only depended on their inputs. And then, of course, you need to provide the dependencies and run the program at uh, runtime at the, at the main effect. Okay, this might be a little bit abstract, uh, but I want you to focus on effectful map and flat map, compose, provide, and run. Because I will explain that how we can implement that. And of course, what are these things? These are monads. Uh, okay, fine, that's a, it's, a, it's a concept, it's a word. Uh, I don't know what it means. Um, <laughs> maybe we can ask a mathematician what it means. Well, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endo functors. Okay, thanks. It's, uh, still don't know what it means. I heard this a couple of times. Um, but what is this pragmatically? So I think that the monad can be viewed as a data structure to reason about the data inside that implements some map and some flat map. And yes, if you construct monads yourself uh, and, and so that other people can use them, you have to consider left and right identity and associativity. But if we just are using these monads, then we don't have to bother with that. And we do this so you can reason about the data inside. So it's basically a container with map and flat map. Okay, what are some examples? A uh, list, for instance, with flat, map and flat map, or an option to reason about whether or not something is there. Uh, either, so it can either be the left-hand side or the right-hand side. IO, it's an, it's an action on, uh, on some input-output. And a reader, or not, where you can take in uh, dependencies or some context and then yield something else. And then you can compose this into this wonderful line underneath here, a reader that takes in a context and yields an I.O. of either an exception or a list of strings. Well, that's nice and abstract, but maybe we can uh, pragmatically look at some code, see how it actually works. Uh, if you're on GitHub, uh, of course, then you can uh, look at this as well, where uh, I've made the code available. So let's talk about a repository. And I think if we are uh, going to do this in a monadic way, uh, Jedi might be the ones that are really pure of thought and, and want to do this in, 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 with monads. So let's consider the Jedi repository. Uh, it can be a port, so a Jedi repository, where we can get a list, we can update it, we can get a specific one, etc. And as you can already see, there is an option there. Because if I get something by UUID, it might be there, it might not be. So it's an option of Jedi. And what does an option look like? How can you minimalistically implement this? Uh, for instance, it can be a sealed class with some value or none. And then you have to, of course, implement a map and flat map, where the map takes in a function from A to B, and the flat map takes in a function from A to option B, and then it will flatten that to the option. So that means that from an option A, you've actually changed it to an option B. So you have reasoned about the data inside the data container. Now, of course, something can go wrong. So what happens if there are exceptions? For this, we can use the either monad to reason about either something going wrong on the left-hand side or something going right on the right-hand side. You can implement this mostly like an option, uh, but now with a left value or a right value where the generic types are either A of no or nothing or nothing or B. And then, of course, you have to implement a map in a flat map to compose these uh, either moments. Well, then, of course, we need to make this a lazily evaluated uh, thing. So we need to wrap this in an I.O. And an I.O. is you take in a function 
of A rather than A itself. And then, of course, that is uh, when you return it, um, it returns a function that you can call and then get A. So this is a lazily evaluated, uh, much like the Kotcha, where uh, we saw that the print, if you wrap it in a function, it doesn't execute. It only executes if you call the function. And then if you implement the map and flat map, you can compose these IOs. Just for uh, convenience sake, we, I use the module pattern here, oh, sorry. Uh, where I define an Excel interface has JEDA repository to actually be able to call the JEDA repository. I define it here, but I will come to that later. <coughs> so now we can get to our domain. And uh, like the hexagonal architecture you, you've just see, seen, uh, this is where your business logic lives. So this is where you really want to uh, reason about your business logic. But for that, of course, we need to take in dependencies and then give back the I.O. And that needs to be done with a reader monad, where you actually get in a generic R, and then you have to specify that R has a JEDA repository and has logger, for instance, or has something else, or whatever you want. And then inside uh, uh, the enclosure there, you can then reason about R.JEDA repository, get all, for instance, uh, and also have some logger log something. And this is not a side effect because it is dependent on the stuff you put in, namely the has logger. Well, how do you then construct the reader? It's basically like an I/O, but it also takes in some argument in that uh, in that function in the in the provide function that you uh, define. So if you have your domain, then you can go to your handlers. So remember, this is much like a Spring uh, setup, like you have a repository, a service, and uh, your controller. So for instance, you can say, I want to bind my get mapping to my purely get all Jedi function. I need to provide a context. Let's define an interface there, Jedi context, that has the repository and has log. So whenever you call this function, you can provide those things. And the same for the uh, things around here. Note that I've omitted something there. I will come back to that. So how do we actually test or run this uh, fully functional program? Well, just implement some repository. Uh, this is a test repository. Um, you can, of course, override these, uh, these methods, or these functions, I should say. And um, uh, with this, you have your implementation. Of course, this can also be a live repository for your uh, production environment. The code itself is not, not that important. <laughs> and then when you test it, this actually looks really like uh, your main effect. Because if you, for instance, uh, test your bind get, you can provide the Jedi context that you have instantiated above with a test logger and a test Jedi repository. Then, because you have to provide to the reader monad that context, then you get back an I.O. Then you need to run and save, because then things can go wrong, can go boom. Then you map over the either take two, for instance, and test whether or not it is the Jedi that you expect. And this is what you want. This is fully referential, transparent, and easy to test, and all, all that good stuff. But if we go back to the handlers, and of course this can also happen in your domain, when you really want to reason about something that is way nested in an option, for instance, I have there, I want to validate whether or not the string I get that it actually is a UUID, then I need to fold it, do some just I.O. it's left. I have to provide the Jedi context, then have the UUID there, map it, then I get an I.O. I have to map it and I have to go inside the either because then in the end I want to use that either UUID also to throw an exception <coughs> or to let the user know that it wasn't found with this UUID. Of course, this is just not okay. Um, in languages that actually are functionally uh, functional programming language, this has been managed by, for instance, the for comprehension in Scala or the do notation in Haskell. But we don't have that in, in Kotlin. So let's see how we can uh, how we can manage this because this is about <laughs> pragmatic, right? And what is up with the reader of a context that yields an I/O either app exception list Jedi? And I started that I want to reason about the business logic and not all this stuff around. So let's see how far we can go with uh, just Kotlin. 
So I think the SIFs are a bit more pragmatic. So let's um, create a SIF repository. And of course, the option that we have, we can just replace with nullable types, right? So it's SIF question mark. If you want to use the either just as an error, error channel, then why not just use result? It doesn't have the left-hand side, but it will only reason about the thing that's inside, the SIF or the SIF list or the optional SIF. But we wrap it in a result because the result can actually handle the, uh, the exception. So let's use that instead of the either. And then, of course, I.O. is about lazily evaluating asynchronous code, stuff like that. So why not just use coroutines there, suspend all these functions, and get a lazily evaluated <coughs> piece of code? Now, how does that uh, look, then, in the SIF domain? Well, I think a lot cleaner, because now you can just, just as well get to your SIF repository. But now, of course, we have to provide some dependencies. Kotlin has, of course, extension functions. So why not use uh, extension functions as a context for where we can store our dependencies? And uh, if we need more, then we can uh, do it the same way with um, generic R, where R has set repository and has log. But of course, we have already learned about context. And we can replace this with the context has it repository has logger, where we can just provide our dependencies to actually get to the shift repository and the log. Note that for single receivers, we can, of course, also use context to just denote that this is the context that we are executing these uh, functions. But it is equivalent to the one below. If you only have one dependency, you can, of course, always uh, write it like that. And then I can immediately include the bind get by your UID because now it's way cleaner. Uh, because if you wrap all this in a run catching, you can just start throwing uh, exceptions, for instance, the not found. And if you are getting a result, um, then you can just get or throw. It will be encapsulated by the run catching. So it acts like a, um, a catch all for all your, all your uh, exceptions. So in this way, I guess, we have managed to replace all these uh, monads with just Kotlin. And then, of course, how do you test or run this? Well, basically in the same way. Uh, we can just create a uh, implement implementation of the repository. I think this also looks already a lot cleaner. And then we can test it in the exactly the same way. We can just implement some SIF context with a test logger and a SIF repo test SIF repository, and then just get the list, take two, and assert whether or not these are the, the objects that we expect. Note that the only thing that you need is the, the get or throw to actually get to the data inside the result. But if you wrap that in a run catching, of course, that is uh, really nice. You, you have your error channel there uh, for free. So just to, uh, to recap, if you really want to use monads, of course, that's a really uh, a powerful tool. Um, also, if you are um, familiar with Arrow, uh, they have a lot of uh, um, monads. I actually got some of the inspiration, of course, from these monads from, uh, from, from Arrow. And of course, if you need more, or if you really need to express an either that is something else than just an exception, feel free to, to use that either. But even in Arrow, they have ditched the IO and the reader for uh, suspend and uh, extension functions in context. So I think that's really nice that, uh, that Kotlin is incorporating these, uh, these things. And of course, option we already had in, uh, with nullable types. And we can replace these things with result of A, A nullable, suspend, and extension functions, or with the context with the multiple receivers. And the nice thing is you can compose these things as well. So in the end, it's just a suspend function on the context that results in a string. As I also showed in the test um, uh, setup, this is actually also how you can use it in, in real life. 
uh, or in, in whatever framework you would like. So if you would want to just use Spring because it's already used in your company or you like the security framework or some other things, you can of course use it because none of the Spring uh, annotations were used here. Uh, you can still use it for your, for your edge of your application. And of course, if you don't want to use Spring or something else, it's also still possible because these are all pure functions that can live either in Ktor or Spring or something else. So that's what I wanted to show you. Thank you for your attention. And if you want to look at the implementation that I have as well in Spring and Ktor, where they uh, are dependent on the core that I just showed, then you can look it up in, uh, on GitHub as well. For inspiration and all other awesome Monad stuff and functional programming, please visit Arrow. Thank you.